Before we get started, I wanted to introduce you to someone really special to me. This is Sushi. My husband and I adopted her a year ago and she is so cute and she's my little reading buddy. Anyways, I'm gonna take her out now so we can record. <laughs> Hello, welcome back to a new video. I just finished a book and I decided I really wanted to make a book review on it because I haven't read one of her books in like 10 years. Cure Cass. We all know her, we all love her. She wrote these three beauties, The Selection, The Elite, and The One, which I don't know if I've talked about this on my channel, but The Selection is my absolute favorite series. Why? Maxin. Kira Cass took the world by storm with this series. For me, this series is comfort, is home. It is probably the first series that really made me fall in love with reading and with romance. And so I've always loved and adored her as an author. Now she hasn't really had a book or series quite hit the way that the selection did. She has done like The Siren, The Betrayed, The Betrothed, which I heard aren't great. <laughs> but she recently came out last year with a Thousand Heartbeats, which is the book I just read and finished and I want to talk about it. So for those of you who haven't read it, it's Dual Perspective, which Kierkegaard has never done, and it's supposed to be like a standalone enemies to lovers. Mind you, this book had every trope. It had enemies to lovers, forced proximity, and forbidden love. <laughs> so let me check on Goodreads. Oh my! This has not had as many ratings as I thought. So it came out November 29th of last year, 2022, and it has about 8,600 reviews on Goodreads. The selection has 1.4 million. So I saw a lot of reviews on Goodreads about her last series, The Betrothed and The Betrayed, and a lot of people, it, people were saying it was sloppy writing, a horrible plot, and just not good character development at all, which is so opposite from The Selection, which I loved and adored so much, and she made such wonderful characters. So I wonder if that may have driven some of her fans away, but I did see a lot of comments on A Thousand Heartbeats say, Kira Cass, I'm giving you this chance. I owe it to my 13 year old self to read this book. And the reviews are quite refreshing. They're really good. So spoiler alert, I, I really liked it and I'm excited to talk about it. So for those of you who haven't read it, it's dual perspective. It's our main character, Princess Annika and Lennox. Lennox is a young man. He's in Dahrain. It's like a little country near to Kadir, which is where Princess Annika is the princess of. Kadir is one of the many countries that kind of combined. Basically, Annika talks about some of the history and a lot of reviewers do say that the world building was not very great, which I didn't notice that, but looking back, maybe, yeah. It is a longer book. It's about 600 pages, 650 pages, but I would say that I didn't feel too out of the loop. I mean, in any book, I'm a little bit overwhelmed or not quite understanding what's happening, but throughout the series, you understand it more. But with this being a standalone and like the world building, I thought it was pretty good. We have Kadir, we have Darain, and there was like many wars and Kadir got their leadership through faithful soldiers and all that. Princess Annika doesn't know too much about their past history just because just because it was unfortunate for a lot of the countries. Da Rain is like a bunch of misfits, people who just kind of come there and the people of Darain like took over an old kingdom and they basically made a life there. So Lennox and his mom live there and there's this guy Kawan who his mom is dating and we we learn more about him as the story unfolds. And that's something I really liked about this book is that the whole book was unraveling everything. The first few chapters, Annika talks about how she was recently like bedridden with an injury and that we're not really sure what. We don't find out for a while and it kind of like keeps us on the edge of our seat. Like we get to discover the characters as the story develops, which I thought was really cool. It kept it really entertaining for me and I really liked that. Lennox is, is like a leader of this like soldier clan that Kawan. So Kawan is kind of the leader of this like newfound country or people, the Darain people. Lennox is sent with an expedition that Kawan has kind of chosen for him. And so that's kind of the start of his story. And Princess Annika kind of starts about how she is forced into a marriage by her father. I really like the dual perspective. I thought that Princess Annika and Lennox were very different from other characters that Kira Cassis wrote. Like Princess Annika to me is not similar to America and Lennox is not similar similar to Maxon. Um, Princess Annika is just very, Princess Annika is very optimistic 
emotional, not too emotional though. Princess Annika is very selfless. She is very duty driven. She knows what she's been called to do as a princess and she's willing to do that. To her friendships, to her people, she truly loves others. She's very charitable. She's very kind. Really, there's not very many flaws. Annika's an amazing person. Lennox is very rough, leadership oriented. He wants to be approved of, non-emotional, does not like to talk about feelings. He has a lot of baggage and a lot of past trauma that we learn about as the story goes on. Lennox also has a hard time just connecting with people. He is just driven by duty. Ooh, they both are driven by duty. What could that entail? Long story short, their stories intertwined and who knows what will happen to their kingdoms, to their countries, to their people. Anyways, I'm guessing most of you here have probably read it, so let's just dive into my favorite part, which is talking about the book. I love Lennox. Let's talk about Lennox. I love his character development. Oh my gosh, this man has been abused by Kwan. Hate that man. The whole time I'm thinking like, who is Kwan to this guy? That's his mom. What happened to his dad? Kwan is an evil little snake and he sent Lennox's dad to die and that was stupid. So that was really interesting to me to see like that Kwan was kind of the reason behind losing both of his parents. There's a lot to un unpack there and I think Lennox has every right to be kind of the calloused guy that he was. But we see throughout the story that although he has no problem taking people's lives, he has no problem fighting for his people and for his duties, he has a conscience there. We see that when he killed Annika's mother, he was so sick. He just couldn't stomach the fact that he had taken a life as someone so graceful. That is kind of him keeping his emotions in because he never talks to anyone about that until he meets Annika. And that part, oh my God. I'm jumping all over the place you guys, but that's how I kind of do my reviews. When Annika and Lennox meet, that was a crazy story because even immediately we start to see Lennox let his walls down a little bit. When she escapes, he wasn't too mad that it happened. I mean, he found her on the expedition, wanted to impress Kawan, it didn't work out. She escaped, he was like, okay. He felt drawn to her. And one of the, my favorite parts is when he was like, what's your favorite constellation? To that point, I don't think he had asked anyone like a question regarding to their likes, dislikes, emotions, to their personality. And then he meets this girl which into which he feels connected to and which he feels guilty to, to which he feels he owes. And he, he finds her in the woods and he tricks Bly, the griffin, everyone that, oh, I couldn't find her and lets her go with his cloak and some food. I don't think it's just because he feels guilty for her mother, but also just because he feels a connection to her. Like he knows that she has a good heart just like her mom. Annika, I don't know if she had much of a connection to him. Her story, oh my gosh, what's his name in the library? Rhett. <laughs> Red. I heard someone compare him to Aspen, but like a creepier, more obsessed version. And I totally can see that, although I didn't really notice that. Like, that's one thing about this book is if I didn't know that Kira Cass wrote it, I wouldn't really have noticed. Rhett was a, wow. That was like right off the bat. He's like, I love you, kisses her. Okay. I liked Rhett actually. I thought he was a very fun and cute character. I thought he's very caring and he's very committed and loyal. And I liked that. I was like, oh, this guy's kind of nice. Although like we didn't really get to see their relationship and also Annika couldn't hear the bells, the love. Also, I love that whole aspect of how Rhett explained it as something you can hear. And Annika was trying to hear love, hear the sound of love with Rhett, but couldn't. She just wasn't feeling it. And then without her permission, even though she was trying not to feel connected to Lennox in the cave, she could hear that. <laughs> That. Nicholas, wow. Nicholas was a crazy character. I feel like at some points this was like a love square because Nicholas was such a dislikable character. Did not like Nicholas at all. I was like, he is the worst man and so stupid and I hated how strict he was. And then he starts to be like, Annika, I love you. And Annika, I want to be better for you. I'm sorry about this. And I'm. So and he was becoming a better guy. And I was like, wow, we love a man who's humble. And I feel like he humbled himself. I wasn't sure what was going to happen there. But of course, I knew Lennox was going to be the one. Now, this is something that I do wish I got to see more of this book. Is I wish I got to see their relationship develop at a slower pace and a little bit more time spent together. I saw some other people say the same thing that there was 600 pages to develop a slow burn romance and the romance developed like that. If there was something that I would change, I would definitely like want more interactions, more moments where their love 
love kind of grew and I loved seeing Lennox's character development and we did see a lot of that on his in Darain and everything but also when he is in the cave with Annika and you know they're ready to kill each other or so they say and they're gonna fight and they're like okay if you're gonna die I might as well spill all my secrets and fall in love with you um I feel like it was so quick that they went from enemies to lovers which I've never seen an enemies to lovers kind of go that quick, but still regardless, like I loved their love story and I loved their romance. I thought it was really cute, especially with them being so opposite and having a lot of connections their whole lives. I don't know how you guys felt. <laughs> I died, I like lost my mind when she was talking about the boy with the apple when she was like 10 years old and she fell in love with him because he gave her an apple and Lennox was like, it was me and he like finished the quote. I don't know why I thought that was so cringy. I definitely feel like there are some cringeworthy parts in this book, but like regardless, I thought it was cute. Also, we haven't even talked about Aeschylus. Aeschylus is her brother, of course, and if we were to take some of their scenes out of context, like we would have thought they were in love. Aeschylus treated her so well. Annika and Aeschylus like never fought. He would like pick her up and spin her around and kiss her on the cheek and say, I love you more than anything. Like that's very like not brotherly. And I really liked Aeschylus. I thought he's the sweetest character. And I totally saw Aeschylus and Noemi. I totally guessed it. I was like, oh my gosh, they're in love. And I low-key loved that. I was like, and then when she discovered it, she was like, how did I not see that coming? And I was like, me too. So yeah, I really liked them together. Except when they ran away at the end, I was like, what the heck, you guys? Like your dad had just died and you're leaving. That was really lame and that totally against his character, but whatever, it added to the drama and anything for love, I guess. And obviously Aeschylus is a very loving character, so he totally would do that. So yeah, we see Annika with her little like sheltered life, wanting to know love, reading romance books. That's totally me wanting love my whole life, reading romance books. And then she meets Lennox and she's like, this is totally not right. Like I'm never, I can't marry him, but I will love him for the amount I have. Okay, first of all, when the three guards were part, when they came over to Darain and they were like, oh, we are creating peace. I totally believed them. What the heck, Palmer? I totally believed you. Did the king not tell you he was lying or were you guys lying? I'm not sure. Yeah, there was war, forced proximity in the cave, they hid in the cave. I loved their conversations. I loved just them talking about when he opened up about his experience with her mom and when she forgave him, I just thought that was an amazing scene and I loved that conversation that they had. For the first time in his life, he was able to open up about things that he had never opened up about, like, oh, these scars, externally and internally, and he opens up to Annika about it because he was under the impression that they never see each other again, that one of them was to end to be dead. I, I thought it was really cute when they were sword fighting, trying to end each other's life, and then they're trying to end each other's lives, and then they were like, oh, maybe it's not a fair game. Maybe we should just talk and get to know each other, you know? Also, for the first time in her life, like, Annika was able to kind of talk about the weight of Nicholas, of the crown, of how she loves her people, but she also knows that she won't be happy keeping everyone else happy. And she accepts that. I really like that she also mentioned Lennox's dad's whole court case, kind of his sentencing and how that whole went. And so they were both able to receive closure on either end. Some things I wish we were able to see, number one, I wish Annika and Lennox were able to visit her mom's grave together. He visited her grave a lot by himself, but they never went together. Um, number two, why did we not know what happened to Kuan at the end? He literally was going to a hearing and then we never hear anything past that. Number three, okay, talk about Nicholas's death. Totally knew it was Nicholas and then it wasn't. And the Kuan is like, yeah, I made a deal with someone under the branches. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's Nicholas. And then it ends up being this random guard that we never heard about. And I totally didn't see it coming though because he killed Nicholas and as soon as Nicholas was like, I know nothing of Kwan, I was like, oh, he's innocent, who could it be? And I was like, it's gotta be Rhett. But Rhett threw his own fit in a different kind of weird love obsessed way. So that was strange. We never know what happened to Rhett either. I know Annika was like, I'm gonna get you out of this kingdom. <laughs> He's freaking psycho. I can't believe I saw anything in him. Yeah, I thought it was really fun and interesting, like the whole political stuff with all the books and her trying to find everything. And then, oh my gosh, I loved the ending when Lennox ended up being the king. Ah, are you kidding me? 
And I love that they also made Aeschylus a duke, which is basically like a chosen prince, not bloodline. I had to look that up, but now I know. I knew something had to happen. I was like, she can't marry Nicholas. There's gotta be a way, but I thought that maybe he, she'd become queen and then just end up marrying him. But the fact that he ended up being the majesty and she was like, He's the king, save the king. I was like, I love this drama, this is so good. That's also like some similarities to the selection is like the whole rebels and the uprising and the wars at the end and everyone dying. Kawan killed Lennox's mother, that was really sad. Like while she was dying, they received closure with each other because that was really a hard relationship for Lennox to love his mother after everything she did. We see that her actions were driven by her love for Lennox and just trying to survive, honestly. Annika, we find out, you know, as time goes on, her dad pushed her into a glass table, which is pretty intense. The king never really has, he never really comes back, you know, he never really fully apologizes. It's just that Annika chooses to forgive him for everything that happened because she knew that once her mom was gone, that her dad just completely changed and was never the same man. Also, Palmer's my favorite character. Okay, not my favorite character, but he's literally so cool. I love him. How he, first of all, was able to escape, see the deaths of his two comrades, and then be like, you know what? I am going to like help Lennox in his love story with Annika. Oh, oh my gosh, we have so much to talk about. But Palmer, you know, like when Lennox sneaks into Annika's room and Palmer's like, ah, don't go in there, Nicholas, like trying to warn them. And like Lennox is like hiding under the bed. I don't know. I just really like the way that Lennox just loved Annika and would give his whole life for her after. Even though Enemies to Lovers was really fast, even after they knew that they were in love, they couldn't be together, and that was a whole story on its own, is trying to live life without having each other in it. Okay, let's talk about Blythe. Oh my gosh! Blythe is the strangest character. I thought of her, like, I literally imagined her as that girl from Dungeons & Dragons the whole time. Just super bad A and kind of unemotional, but secretly in love. Blythe is obsessed with him. I actually did not see that coming until she confessed it to him and was like, I hope that you can feel love. And he's like, Blythe, no. And then she gives him, and she gives him the bracelet and I died. But I love that he was able to talk to her. Well, he didn't even get to say anything. She was like, I'm doing this for you. Goodbye. I was super mad that, you know, she can supposedly love someone and then destroy their lives just because he's in love with someone else. That was super lame and super also like love up, love obsessed, but I thought it was a very interesting moment when Griffin came up. Not Griffin, it was the Inigo. Inigo was like, well, are you in the race? Because I wanna win with Blythe. And I was like, holy cow, did not see that coming either. All these twists and turns in this book, I was like, yeah, but I ended up really liking them together because they're very opposite of each other and I thought that it was really cool that Inigo was like, you checked the lace in your pocket like five times, Lennox. Of course I knew that you're in love with Princess Annika and I was like, oh, Lennox checked the pocket for his lace. I love that they switched like her lace and his like tassel thing. I love that he wore his dad's cloak. That was the coolest thing ever. If Kira Cass wanted to, like she could have made a series out of it. It made me giddy and it was an entertaining read. And honestly, even though it was a longer book, it felt really fast to me. I'm glad we were able to discuss. I don't know how many people actually watch this just because I don't know how many people have actually read it. Yeah, I really liked the epilogue too when they had their little baby. Lennox is a completely different man and I just, well, that's the thing. He didn't, he wasn't a completely different man. He was just a man who wasn't able to express his emotions. And I loved him as a character. I, he's probably my favorite. I loved Lennox. He's so great. Anyways, that's my review for A Thousand Heartbeats. Also, can we talk about the cover? It is stunning. Someone said it looks like it was made on Canva. I don't care. It is beautiful. I love that the ocean waves are in her dress. That's a wrap. Thanks for watching. Bye.